Good morning everyone and welcome to the Sydney Sunday, Sunday service and also an amazing day to celebrate all the mothers in our lives who have done so much for us. And I would really like to thank God for, for this very special occasion to celebrate them and all the hard work. It really reminds me of a scripture in Proverbs 31 verse 25 to 27. It says, She is clothed in strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instructions on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. I really like this scripture because I can really relate it to my mother. Because she's a very important person in my life and she follows the example in this scripture. She speaks with lots of wisdom and she says many great faithful instructions that she leads by an amazing example for her family and does anything she can to help us. She is working all the time but still does lots for others, especially family. I'd like to thank her for being, for being there for me when I needed her and I'd just like to thank all the mothers in our lives. You do your best for your families and you're so eager to help them. I'm so grateful you put I'm so grateful God put my mother in my life so it's as someone I can look up to. Not literally. <laughs> I now like to let my fabulous mother share. Thank you, Nathan. Oh, he's so cheeky. I'm so grateful to God for the church and the Bible and my mum. They're people that have instructed me on how to be the best mum I can be. I know that Nathan wouldn't be saying such lovely words about me without all of that guidance mm. in my life. Um, and our family is so blessed to be part of, with all of you, part of the church. Um, you have, it's just great to be part of that greater family. And we're just so glad that you could join us for church today. I'll now pass to my fabulous mum. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul writes to Timothy to encourage him. and says, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that now lives in you also. Faith through the ages is often shared and passed down from grandmother to mother to grandchildren. Indeed, my first belief in a God who wanted a personal relationship with me was planted by my grandmother. She used to have her own version of a quiet time when she went in the evening to her room to pray. She influenced me more than she would ever know. Um, she was Irish and we grew up in the church. Um, but in 1963, she left and she helped me to begin to question what I believed and why. It was about over 20 years later that someone actually sat down with the scriptures with me and I became a disciple. When Nathan made his decision a few weeks back, to make Jesus Lord of his life. It was, it was after many, many years of prayer, and it was one of the happiest days of my life. On this Mother's Day, I want to encourage all the moms and grandmas out there to continue to pray for and to fan into flame the flicker of faith that's planted in the hearts of our children. They are watching and they are listening, and they are influenced more by what we do than what we say. Welcome everyone to church today, especially the moms. We hope you feel welcome, and we're so glad to have you join us as we worship God. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for a day to celebrate the mothers in our lives. Thank you for all that they do for us and all the hard work that they give us because of you, Lord. I thank for this day, to, uh, the time to worship you. 
I pray that the visitors can really that they can really get inspired by you and the Bible, and I can and can be a part of the church soon. I pray for the sermon today and that we all, can all get convicted by your word. I love you, God, and I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. 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 She's kind, caring, amazing, beautiful, loving, and the best mom in the world. I love that my mom always cares about me and is there every step of the way. Mom, happy Mother's Day. Just thank you for the way that you really uh, go after your relationship with Diego and I and really love us. I love that my mom is so kind and generous towards others. One thing I love about my mom is how encouraging she is. Uh, one thing I love about my mom is that she's my mom. I love that my mom is the best chef that I know, and she provides me with the most amazing dishes, and I love tasting them every day. I really love my mom's biblical insight and the way she's able to really understand people and give really good advice. I love that my mom always sacrifices and wants the best for her children. Mom loves me. I love that my mom is always supporting me. I love that my mom is healthy and alive. I love that my mom is sweeter than sugar. I love that my mom is brave and smart. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy! I love my mom because she always provides for me. I love my mom because she gave me birth and helps me do art. I love that my mom is funny, the greatest cook ever, and has this unconditional love for God and my family. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Hey, Mom. I love you because of your dedication and you're just loving for others. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day! Day. Mother's Day, I love you. Love you, Mom. Hola, my name is Micah, and this is my beautiful wife, Claire. On the far left is my mother-in-law, Tina, and this is my sister-in-law, Mara. We're honored to be able to share communion with you all today. I also wanted to wish all the mothers watching a happy Mother's Day. You know, this is the time of the service where we focus our hearts on the cross and remember what Jesus did for us thousands of years ago. Please turn with me to John chapter 19, verses 23 to 30. It reads, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with a garment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciples, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty, a jar of wine vinegar, was there so they soaked the sponge in it but put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus lips when he had received the drink Jesus said it is finished with that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit now, prior to this Jesus when Jesus was arrested all the disciples he had been with for three years deserted him 
His closest disciple Peter deserted him as well and denied him three times when he was asked if, if he knew Jesus. But his mom stayed on with him right up to his death. He was loved and supported by his mother through all throughout his life. Even when he was dying on the cross, he too, he also was thinking of his mom, how he can love and support her. You know, the depth of that connection and love with his mom is evident in this scripture. You know, we can have that same deep connection with Jesus too. He was thinking of us and how he would love us way before we were born. I'm gonna, now I'm going to give this time to Claire to share. Um, I'm really grateful that I um, had a mom that taught me about God growing up. She would read us the Bible and also take us to church regularly. But as I grew older, I became really uninterested in getting to know God or going to church or reading the Bible. Um, and I've always known my mom is a really faithful woman of God. And I think it would take a lot of faith for someone to um, know that uh, her children would eventually want to seek God. Um, yeah, and I think it's amazing how Jesus died on the cross for us, not knowing whether or not that we would choose to follow him one day or reject him. And I think that really shows his incredible, unconditional love for us. I love how um, yeah, Mary stood by Jesus um, the whole time, even though she had to watch him go through all that pain and suffering, she still stood by her son. And yeah, in the same way my mom has always stood by me, she always done her best to teach me about God and um, teach me the importance of having a relationship with Him. And yeah, now that I'm a disciple, she's continuously helping me um, to grow. Like she's always um, yeah, telling me things about what she's learned and praying with me and um, yeah, always taking me to teens um, after a long day at work. And yeah, she's always um, led by example and shown her love through her actions, which is the same with Jesus as he showed his love through um, dying on the cross for us. And I, I see Mary as a mom and, you know, she starts off very young and is Jesus's, um, has Jesus as a as a very young mom and, and has watched him grow through his life and there were times when she, you know, she, they were on par and she sort of, she, you know, really believed him or even followed him and there were times when, you know, she made mistakes and I just think as a mom, you know, she was a, just a great example of someone that was human and, and um, you know, at times watched from afar but also very close and it's really, um, encouraging to see her at the cross as a mother, you know, really standing by her son, but also Jesus just really looking, you know, in his pain and agony, looking down at her and really, um, you know, organizing that, not so much organizing, but seeing that John can look after her and she can be, you know, a, a mother to John. And, and even at that time, he really loved deeply and, and really um, thought about her and the same as he has done for me all my life, and and I feel like as um, you know, as a, a great example to follow. So as we take the bread and the wine, we all know what it is like to have a mother or to have someone that takes care of us. A lot of us, a lot of time, we understand this love and connection we have for each other. You know, a mother's love is like Jesus' love. So as we take the bread and the wine, let's let's be reminded of the love that Jesus sowed on the cross for us and be, be grateful of the reminders that God has given us through our mothers. Uh, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for blessing our lives. Thank you for uh, this uh, awesome opportunity to be able to, reminded of, to be reminded of your love. Help us to always uh, uh, remember what the love that Jesus had sown for us on the cross, Father. Help us to be, to be grateful for the love we have shown through our mothers, Father, through our people that have taken care of us throughout our lives, Father. Help us to, 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 to see that as reminders of your love, to be grateful of, 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 of that love that you've given us, Father. Help us to continually follow your, our, our, your will in our lives, Father. Help us to, to, to always uh, strive to live lives worthy of the calling that, that we have received through, through Jesus at the cross, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast for me to say, service where we give contribution to be able to support the work of the church. I just wanted to thank you all for continually giving during this time. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for, for, all, for providing for us. Thank you for, 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 for continually helping us throughout this situation that we are in, throughout this pandemic. Help us to continually give out of the joy of our hearts, Father. Uh, help us to always support, support the growth of your kingdom, Father. Thank you, Father, for, for everything given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, family. I'm Zach Fazio with the Kidogo YouTube channel. We want disciples to know where they can go online to find information and resources for our churches. So please, share this video with your church to help your members stay informed. First, there's DisciplesToday.org, the official website for the ICOC. Disciples Today is a portal to find all kinds of resources made for disciples. For example, click the resources section to find downloadable podcasts, Bible talks, Christian professional workshops, and an app that contains all of our Bible study series. There's also hundreds of inspiring articles about churches, conferences, and service projects. The fastest way to stay informed is to sign up for their free monthly newsletter. Disciples Today is also home to the ICOC Church Locator, where you can find contact information on hundreds of ICOC churches worldwide. There's also DT Heart and Soul, a matchmaking platform like eHarmony that hosts men and women from our family of churches. Finally, Disciples Today wants to hear from you. Please fill out their survey so they can know what your communication needs are in all the different parts of the world. Next, there's the Kidogo YouTube channel. That's us. We make Christian videos. 
Find our channel by searching for Kidogo, K-E-Y-D-O-G-O. The videos feature inspiring stories, testimonies, and updates about upcoming events. We also have a series of videos that explain biblical doctrines and controversial issues. We also just uploaded our feature-length movie, Finding Guy. It's a documentary about a gay man who found Jesus and then started a worldwide movement to bridge the gap between the LGBT community and the church. The movie has received standing ovations from people all around the world. You can watch all three parts of the movie right here on YouTube. And please click the subscribe button so you can be notified when we make new videos. We're getting closer and closer to reaching 10,000 subscribers. Thank you for taking a moment to let us talk about global communication. We praise God for how he continues to bless our family of churches and keep us unified. God bless. Welcome to the Sydney Church of Christ, to our virtual service. This is a special day, but it's very special because it's also Mother's Day. I lost my mother this year. It was a day to especially remember her and to be thankful for all that she was in my life. And of course, the tremendous service she provided in raising three children. It's a time to treasure those memories that seem to come in the grief process. One thing for sure in that process is the occasional regret of what I should have done. And I say this to encourage everyone to reduce the regrets by increasing the encouragement and the appreciation of our moms now when we have the chance. This day, this day fits our text this morning. Our text is about giving and whoever gives as much as our moms do to the family. They go beyond what is expected. So let's read our text this morning and draw a few points, especially remembering our moms. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very, very severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had early made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving, this act of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test, to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he, made him, he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is accept acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. The goal is equality as it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. The setting here concerns the church-wide collection that Paul had organized to help the Jerusalem church while, he was going, while they were going through some hard times. As you might remember reading through the book of, 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 of Acts in the early days, uh, the, the, church, it was, the Jerusalem church was the first church. It was a church that had been so sacrificial in the early days because so many people had become disciples, 3,000 in one day. It was Passover time and the pilgrims had come in. People from all over the whole Mediterranean world, all these nations, and they became disciples. They, they were waiting uh, for the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus, in fact, had said over and over again that they were to go to the ends of the earth. But they somehow misunderstood that and they had the ends of the earth coming to them. 
And so all the disciples were staying there waiting for an imminent return to Jesus. And to pay for that, the local disciples, those who lived in Jerusalem, took their, their, their money and their property and, and their houses and they sold it all and liquidated it all to take care of these pilgrims. And so now Paul wants to, these Gentile churches to express their gratitude for this first this great sacrifice that eventually enabled the teams to go out and plant the church throughout the Roman world and to, and to make a contribution to show them how much they appreciated their sacrifice. And also in some sense, to show the Jews who are persecuting the church, hey, these Gentile churches are taking care of their Jewish brothers as well. Well, this leads us to the first point, beyond the call of duty. You know, mothers always go beyond the call of duty. One, one woman writer wrote after holding her newborn daughter, she writes, she loved her daughter more than evolution required. You know, mothers love beyond the call of duty. But so did these churches in Macedonia. Uh, here's a map of, of, of this area. And, and there were churches, uh, the Macedonian churches were the church in Philippi, uh, in Thessalonica, and Berea. And, and verses 1 through 5, it, it seems that when the collection was, start, was first started, Paul did not include the Macedonian churches, presumably because they were also having a hard time. In verse 2, he mentions their severe trials, their, their severe afflictions, and yet their outpouring of joy. So perhaps Paul skipped them thinking, well, how, how can they really help? But when they heard, that is the Macedonian churches, they were eager to participate. The financial state of the Macedonian church was tough compared to the abundance that the Corinthian church had, naturally being part of a very wealthy part of the Roman Empire. Corinth was placed geographically to prosper with the free trade zone in the Roman Empire. Their, the main shipping routes ran from what's known as Turkey now all the way uh, to uh, Rome, right through Corinth. Uh, Corinth was like Panama. What's the richest church? What's the richest country in Central America? It's Panama. And why do you think? Well, because of the canal that runs through there. Well, Corinth was also a canal city. They would actually drag uh, tr uh, ships across that narrow isthmus there. Uh, and, and they had begun digging there as well, this canal. And, and so Corinth, Corinth had, had, this, had these blessings in a, in a financial way. Uh, you know, Corinth uh, uh, understood all that. Yet despite their blessings, there seems to be a reluctance to meet the need once the need passes and has been expressed. Okay, now it's time to give. And so Paul will send Titus there. Their reluctance, of course, is contrasted with the Macedonian churches. They didn't just volunteer to do their duty. They wanted to go beyond the call of duty. They wanted to give. In fact, in verse 4, it says they literally begged, in Greek word, do it, deomai. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. Wow, the privilege of sharing. That is better to give than to receive. Do we believe that? Do we really believe that? You know, I really appreciate the church uh, uh, here in Sydney and in churches in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, because they take, we've taken up a collection for the Fiji church. We have about 120 disciples there, and 60% and of them have lost their job because of, there's no tourism in Fiji. And so uh, we, we express to the Fijian church, what can we do to help? And so our, our, our region, our goal as a region was to raise $20,000 in Australia and in New Zealand for our church. I wrote Tony an email recently, and I said, we've collected just in Sydney, approaching 19,000 Australian dollars for the Fijian dis disciples. And it will go higher, feeling confident of, that we'll get about 30,000 when Melbourne and Brisbane and the Gold Coast and Perth uh, all make contributions, and in, and, and in Auckland. And I, write, and I wrote to him, I said, it is our joy, Tony, to give. We love our Fijian brothers and sisters. Well, Tony responded, oh, brother, such great news. Thank you in all capital letters. But when I got your text, Tony, Tony writes, I was reminded how you're giving parallel that of another church in Macedonia. And then he quotes 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. Now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty walled up in rich generosity for they gave, for I testify they gave as much as they were able 
even beyond the, their ability, entirely on their own. And they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. Then not only did they give, but in Paul's situation, estimation, they literally exceeded our expectations. Well, what did Paul expect? Well, obviously something less. They gave in verse 2, in the midst of severe trial, overflowing joy and extreme poverty, not in the good times, but in the bad times. Their generosity flowed out of poverty and joy. Their giving was like the poor widow in Mark chapter 12, verse 44, where Jesus says, they gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put everything in. We don't know the other people, but we know about her because all she gave all she had. The Lord is interested in qualitative rather than quantitative giving. Verse 12 says, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. Acceptable. I believe also that the Macedonian churches had empathy. But who were these churches, the Philippi, the Philippi church, the Berean church, the Thessalonian church? Well, if you read the book of Acts, you know in the gospel of Bainu to Philippi, Paul reached out to some women by the well, and then he, and then, uh, he cast out a demon from this girl. He's, he's beaten and thrown in jail. Uh, there's an earthquake in the middle of the night. He converts the, the, the jailer and his family. And then he's run out of town, asked to leave town. So the church was getting persecuted. The Thessalonica church started, started well. And, and then, then there was opposition, and Paul again was asked to leave town. And then in Berea, the exact same thing happened. It started well, but then the persecution happened. So what do these churches have in, in common with the Jerusalem church? They know, knew what it was like to undergo persecution. You know, they, Corinth, perhaps, in contrast, did not have a commotion. They did have a co commotion. The Jewish uh, people brought them before the Roman uh, governor there. And the end result of, of, of that, the Roman government decided that the Jews, they, they got a beating and the church was, was protected. Jerusalem, as we know, had undergone persecution in the church and was still, it was still going on. And the Master church, Macedonian churches had empathy. They were having a hard time. We remember how that feels. And it's good to have empathy like our moms do for our lives as well. The second point, is the act of grace. It says in this text, in fact, twice, he says, so we urge Titus, just as he had made an earlier a, a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel again in the ESV version, this act of grace, the same Greek phrase. It's, it's actually... Uh, it's actually, as, as that slide says, this simple three letters or three words in the Greek language, you know, in this grace, uh, both in verse 6 and verse 7, the translators in both ESV and NIV add this act of, uh, this act of grace because it was, they had to, to show that the grace was not just grace, but it produced some movement, some action. And so Paul writes there, you urge Titus there, to bring to completion again this act of grace. Grace demands, expects, assumes that actions follow grace. Even in the New Testament, there, there, there was and there still is in our own day those who I think abused the grace of God. There were, there were, they, these were those who Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 16, who have distorted Paul's message his, or his teachings, most likely Paul's great teachings of God's grace this clear, this, this, this clear message, but it had been distorted. So Paul himself in Romans 6 left to, to speak to those who, who were saying, are we to sin that grace may increase? By no means. And again, those who were using God's grace as an excuse for sin. Paul will address that misconception. It's a misconception that kind of says, I'm saved by grace. I can't really lose that. It doesn't really matter how I live. Maybe it's not as blatant as that. Maybe it's like, I'm saved by God's grace. Let me just relax and don't get guilted out just because I'm not really doing much besides attending church. And even that I don't do very regularly. Paul will speak of this often. Paul, in fact, about his own life, writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. 
But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me, this act of grace. Grace has actions to it. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that has appeared that offers salvation to all people, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave up, gave for us, gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You know, there's a, a parable, that, a passage that, that Jesus gives in Matthew 18, verse 23. And I won't, I won't read it to you, it's too long, but I'll tell you the story, and if you know your Bibles, you, would, you will remember it. This talks about the kingdom of God is like a king who wanted to settle accounts, and one of his servants owed him 10,000 bags of gold. 10,000 was a way of expressing the biggest number you could possibly express, and an enormous debt. He's, and the guy did not, could, could not pay. The king said, throw him into prison. The guy begged for mercy. And the king, out of his great mercy, canceled his debt. Now the fellow went out, and some man owed him $50. And he said, pay me. And the guy said, I can't, please. Please don't throw me into prison. And the guy says, no, you're going to prison. But when the king heard what had happened, how this, he had canceled millions of dollars of debt, and this guy doesn't cancel 50. He says, find that guy and throw him into jail because the grace has had no impact or effect upon his life. The servant was shown mercy, but did his receiving mercy flow through to his interactions with others? In the master's eyes, it wasn't a good suggestion or hope that he might learn something. No, there was an expectation that it happened. You know, I, like many of you, have been watching a bit more television than normal. And, and, uh, uh, and I, I don't know whether that's good or bad, but I, I'm, try, I'm getting tired of it. Uh, that, but recently, we've been watching a show that's been, that's been remade, according to Google, at least 11 times. And then it was made into a musical. And, it's been, and I've, I've seen the musical twice at the West End, and, and, and they made that into a movie, too. It's called Les Miserables, or however they pronounce that. Uh, by Victor Hugo, Les Mis, written in 1862, about a character named Jean Valjean. And you know, you may not, you, you may, if you don't know the story, it's a great story. It's a guy who, who according in the, in the novel, was thrown in prison for stealing a loaf of bread to, to feed his sister's children. And while in prison, he has, he has a hard time, and, and he finally gets out, but he's having a hard time, and the jailer there, uh, the, the, the warden there, the uh, it's so hard, and, and, and he always follows the law exactly. He gets out, and because, of course, he's an ex-convict, he's having a hard time making it. And, and he goes, and, and he's having a hard time, and he, and he, and he, and he goes to a priest's house because he's recommended to go to this fellow's house. And there the priest takes care of him and feeds him and gives him a place to stay the night. And then in the middle of the night, Valjean gets up and decides to steal the silver. And he takes the silver and bolts. He's caught by the gendarmes or the Paris by the police, and he's brought back down, brought back to the to the to the to the priest. And he said, "Father, we've must, must, yeah, we we we've captured this this guy, and he has your silver here. Or we we brought him back here." And, and the priest says, "You've got it all wrong. He didn't steal that silver. I gave it to him. And in fact." He forgot the two candlesticks that I wanted to give him as well. And he gives him the candlesticks. And then the police leave, and he turns to Valjean. He said, I have bought your soul with this mercy. Go out and show mercy to others. And the movie, of course, goes on. He takes that money and, and really does show mercy, but he finds himself once not taking care of this poor single mom who's been abused and, 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 and really... Uh, fires her, and she, her life goes in a terrible way trying to protect her daughter until her health fails, and he comes to her and says, I was so wrong not to show mercy towards you, and she says, please take care of my daughter, and he says, I will, I promise you, and the story goes on and on about that, but it's a story about 
it's a, this act of grace, this grace that has effect. Is God's grace having impact in our lives, in your lives, especially in terms of giving? Our mothers gave us such grace, showed us such grace, forgave us time and time again. Uh, and again, uh, we, we, we respond to that gratitude. The third and last point is the pursuit of excellence. The pursuit of excellence. You know, uh, it says, verse 7, but since you excel in everything, see that you excel also in this grace of giving. It has the sense of, of, of excelling uh, or being ha having a, an abundance or, or overflowing. Uh, Luke 6, 38 says, uh, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken down, and running over, pouring over, and, and it will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If you're giving, it will be given back. Am I excelling in all of these things, in faith, in, in love, and, uh, but also in my giving? And the point, the point Paul is making. <clears throat> Paul is not commanding them in verse 8. He recognized and respected the church's sense of, in, of independence. But he also recognized local, he recognized local decision making, but at the same time, we're all connected. You know, I, I called the other church leaders in Australia and New Zealand and said, can we all get together and, and help with the church in Fiji? And I, I can I not I wasn't I didn't command it. I can't command it, but we're connected. And and I didn't need to ask twice. Everybody said, of course. How how could any of our brothers and sisters not eat? Uh, in the land, in this rich land that we live in, you know, Paul, Paul was Paul will challenge them to excel, and whatever spiritual disciplines he says to be abundantly fruitful, to be abundantly encouraging, to be abundantly growing in our knowledge of God, to be abundantly earnest, to be abundantly loving and abundantly giving in this text. But what would that look like? To excel always means some kind of measurement. I mean, how else can one determine this? So in verse 8, he is testing, he says, their sincerity, the earnestness of love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. He's already done that in chapter 8. One. He's, he talks about the Macedonian churches and he compares them in some sense to the church at, at uh, Corinth. We, he says, we want you to you know the, about the grace that God's given the Macedonian churches and how, and how out of their poverty they gave so much. It, it welled up, it says. The co co comparison with others often cause us to have a knee-jerk reaction when it comes to our spirituality, particularly. We compare it, uh, we, we acknowledge that it's part of, our, of life and education. We are compared in, work, in our workforce. We are compared. In athletics, we are compared. We get compared and compare us ourselves and, and, and compare others. But somehow, you don't use my brother or sister as a comparison. Uh, maybe it goes back to our childhood when maybe a parent would say, why don't you be more like your brother or sister? And boy, didn't we hate hearing that. Didn't we hate hearing hearing that? But Paul will go deeper than that in this text. In, this, you know, in, in verse 9, he says, Look, I'm not going to compare you just to the Macedonian churches. That's your brothers and sisters. I'm going to compare you to Jesus. Verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. He wasn't comparing Jesus' earthly life when he was a trade, a carpenter in Nazareth. He was comparing what Jesus left in heaven to, to, to give up and to give all that up for us, for us to save us. The test is this, the test of, he says, this is the test of sincerity. Of our love in verse 8, he says. So how does our love compare to Jesus' love? When I'm studying the Bible with people, especially the cross and its impact in our lives, uh, I always study Romans 5, you know. And in Romans 5, Paul will write, While we were weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For, for, once, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though for perhaps a good person one might dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him in his, from his wrath? 
For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now that we've been reconciled shall we be saved by his life? And I explain it this way, because Paul will say very rarely you'll see people act heroically to die for their friends and families or fellow soldiers. In other words, die for a righteous person, not meaning righteous in the spiritual sense, but a, but a good a good person. An example is often I, I illustrate is perhaps you're a group of soldiers and a live grenade is thrown in your midst. And the natural reaction is for everybody to die for cover. But then one, unlike the others, throws himself on the grenade to protect his fellow soldiers. As Paul Wright as Paul writes, this rarely does happen. In fact, they are celebrated as heroes because most of us just scatter. And 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 but but then what would happen if if instead of of, of of that scene, your fellow soldiers are lined up and the enemy's coming, and one of your fellow soldiers jumps up in front of you and says, Don't shoot the enemy, shoot me. The soldiers will think you're crazy. That, that's that's crazy love. That's that's uh, that's foolish love. And Paul will say, Yeah. God gave his son to die for his enemies. That's crazy love. That's foolish love. Compare your love to that. Am I loving like that? And now back in our text in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul, Paul says, compare your, compare your love to that. Jesus loved us so much that he gave up heaven and all that it means to come down to this planet to give us riches. I mean, how can you compare when gold is used as road material in heaven? To our, to our understanding of what riches is all about. So much love. So much sacrifice. You know, it's Mother's Day. And so many mothers have given up so much for the sake of their children. But it's also Sunday. A special day when we remember how much Jesus has given up for us. And how much he has loved us. We want his grace to impact our lives. We want to go beyond the call of duty and function in the call of love and gratitude. We want in all of our lives to express in the many ways that God has blessed us for it to overflow in every part of our walk with God. So let's have a great day letting love and giving overflow. Let's put some actions to grace, especially expressing our appreciation to our moms and not only expressing it, but showing some action of service at the same time but not only to our moms, but to our, our husbands, to our wives, our relatives, our workmates, our brothers and sisters in, in, in Christ. Let grace impact our church. Amen. I've got a hope. Face to face, face to face, in hell.
was lost. Jesus, he found me. Jesus, he found me. His blood on the cross. Thank you for joining us this Sunday on a special Mother's Day service. Yeah, what a way to start off a Mother's Day. Hopefully we get to join our families and have lunch and fun times. Um, thank you to the people that contributed to our service today, for the amazing sermon, the communion, and the wonderful singing. So inspiring and so encouraged, me as a mom and grandma. We have a few announcements. Um, this week we're meeting in Bible Talks. And next Sunday will be regional services via Zoom. And on the 24th of May will be a new Christian reception and a Sunday service on YouTube. So thanks again for joining us and hope you have a great day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day.